Hi, today's lecture is on section 4.3 in the Lock 5 textbook, and this section is on statistical significance. This section expands on last section, which was on p-values, and kind of lets us get a little bit more information around a p-value, a little bit more understanding of whether or not a p-value is small, what we mean by a small p-value, and ultimately how we can use a p-value to use this language called statistical significance. So today what you're going to learn about are using the p-value as a measure of strength of evidence as well as statistical significance and formal statistical testing. And you're going to learn about the various processes involved in formal hypothesis testing. And then you're going to learn about informal statistical decisions. So let's go ahead and get started. So as a quick reminder, imagine that we have a null hypothesis, which is that our mean is equal to zero in the population, versus the alternative that the mean is not equal to zero. And then we have a sample mean, which we've calculated from our sample. This is all hypothetical. And our sample mean equals negative two. Well, <clears throat> in order to calculate a p-value, we need to first generate a randomization distribution and that is what we're seeing below here. So this could be a randomization distribution, which is going to approximate our sampling distribution when the null hypothesis is true. And so we've gone ahead and we've done that, and what we're going to do to find our p-value is we're gonna look for negative two on our randomization distribution, and because our, our alternative hypothesis has a less than sign, we're going to shade the region to the left, and that region is called the p-value as I have shown in that image before I shaded it and that what I've shaded again. Now, if we have the same information, but this time our alternative is that it's greater than, we're again gonna find negative two, but we're gonna shade the area to the right, the area that's greater than that. And so our p-value is gonna be much bigger. And as I mentioned last time, the entire area under this curve is going to sum up to one. So both this, this p-value and the p-value before would have summed up to one. So this is what we would have if we had a sample mean of uh, negative two. It, uh, the, the previous slide was for if our alternative was less than. This is if our alternative for our population mean is greater than. In the situation where it's a not equal to sign for our, our alternative hypothesis, then what we're going to do is we're going to locate negative two on our um, on our distribution right here, and we're going to shade the area that is corresponds to the smaller tail. So we could shade to the left, right, this area, or we could shade to the right. If we look, we certainly see that the area to the left is a smaller area. So we're going to shade that area, and then we're going to take that value and multiply it by two. Because of symmetry in, uh, in uh, these distributions, it you'll also see that it can also be written like this. And so essentially what we're gonna see there is that the p-value is the sum of these two areas or the p-value is just the area to the left multiplied by two. Those two concepts are the same because of the symmetry in this distribution. Now hopefully that idea makes a little bit of sense to you. If not, you'll be able to see it as we're progressing throughout the semester um, in the next couple classes, as well as the activities that you're working on, you'll be able to see that and that will help make sense to you. So. Let's talk about statistical significance because statistical significance is a term that gets thrown around a lot. It gets thrown around a lot sort of in casual speech, kind of like a correlation, but then it has a very specific and a formal definition. And that is what we're going to talk about today. So just as a reminder, a p-value is the probability of observing a statistic as extreme or more than that observed given that the null hypothesis is true. And I mentioned last time that instead of the word statistic, we could put the word sample in there. So observing a sample as extreme or more, we could also put the, the word results in there. You know, it's is the probability of observing the results as extreme or more than what we observed. So it's basically going to ultimately talk about your sample. You know, something that you calculate on your samples as a statistic, your results is sort of a, maybe a more informal way to kind of refer to your statistics. So what the p-value represents is a measure of strength against the null hypothesis and in support of the alternative hypothesis. The smaller 
the p-value is, it's going to be the stronger your evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of the alternative. And then the flip side exists as well. So if your p-value is large, that means you're going to have weak evidence against the alternative, and you're going to have weak evidence in favor of the alternative. <clears throat> but now what we want to do is we want to actually be able to quantify this, not just, not just use words around it. We want to actually be able to make a proper statistical decision. So when p -value is, when the p-value is small enough, we say the sample results are statistically significant. But what do we mean by small enough? How do we determine what is small enough? Well, we do this by setting something called a significance level. And we're going to refer to our significance level by this Greek letter called alpha. So that is alpha. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is if our p-value that we calculate is less than alpha, we're going to conclude that our results are statistically significant. Okay, so I'm going to sort of put these in italics because I feel like it still is kind of one of those one of those terms where it's like you're statistically significant. And the reason I say that is because our alpha can be set to any value. In general, when people are doing science, they'll set alpha to 0 0.05. And so when our calculated p-value is less than 0 0.05, we have statistically significant results. In our class, you can always assume that alpha equals 0 0.05 unless it's stated otherwise. So on a quiz, on an activity, if I ask you if the results are statistically significant, you're basically looking to see, is your p-value that you calculated, is it less than alpha? If it is, great. Your results are statistically significant. Now... <clears throat> That's one way to think about it. And we'll talk about another one shortly. So when we're doing formal statistical, de de statistical decisions, given some significance level of alpha and our p-value from our sample, if our p-value is less than alpha, we're going to our decision is going to be to reject the null hypothesis. We will say that our results are significant. And we will say we have convincing evidence that the alternative is true. When our p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, we do not reject the null hypothesis. The results are not significant, and we don't have convincing evidence that the alternative is true. Okay, that's with formal statistical decisions. Now, a more nuanced and arguably a better approach than making this sort of dichotomous decision of reject, don't reject the alternative hypothesis Sorry, I do not mean the alternative. I mean the null hypothesis. A dichotomy to sort of this reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. Because remember, we never reject or not reject the alternative, as I said. So I just misspoke. Um, is to consider a p-value is a measure or of informal strength of your evidence. So if your p-value is large, say 0.1, right? Because if we turn these into proportions, that would be 0.1. This would be 0.05, this would be 0.01. If our p-value is large, we would say we have little evidence against the alternative and for the alternative. Ag Excuse me, I did it again. Against the null hypothesis and for the alternative hypothesis. If our p-value is greater than 10%. Now, if our p-value is, say, between 10, uh, point, uh, 0.1 and, say, 0 0.05, we could say that we have some evidence or we could say we have weak evidence against the uh, null hypothesis and in favor of our, our, of our alternative hypothesis. If our p-value is less than 0 0.05 and say between 0 0.01, we can say that we have moderate to strong, I mean moderate to strong evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of the alternative. And if our p-value is very small, say less than 0 0.01, we have very strong evidence. Now this corresponds roughly to this 0 0.05 above here, right? So if our p-value is greater than 0 0.05, assuming that alpha equals 0 0.05, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Or And when it's less than 0 0.05, we do reject the null hypothesis. Now, this seems maybe somewhat nuanced, this, this difference, and maybe somewhat linguistic. But 
when we're thinking about it as a strength of evidence, we're not really making a formal statistical decision. We can see that when our p-value is really, 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 really small, that means we have strong evidence, extraordinarily strong evidence against our alternative. I mean, oh, I keep misspeaking. I'm so sorry about that. We have extremely small evidence against our null hypothesis. When our p-value is really, 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 really large, we have very, very weak evidence against our alternative hypothesis. I mean, our null hypothesis. I do not understand why. I keep getting these uh, mixed up. I'm just going to write it down. Okay, so when, when p is very very small strong evidence against h0 our null hypothesis and in favor of h a which is our alternative when p is very very large weak evidence Um, weak evidence against H0 and in favor of HA. Hopefully I didn't confuse it there too much by uh, misspeaking uh, around this. But when your p-value is very, 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 very small, that means essentially it's extraordinarily unlikely that you would have observed the results that you would have given that the null hypothesis is true which means you have very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. When your p-value is really, 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 really large, that means it's totally possible and very, very, very plausible that you would have observed these results, given that the null hypothesis is true. So that means you have, ex you have really weak evidence against it, and you have uh, very weak evidence in favor of your alternative. So I, th I consider this uh, way of thinking about it more as strengths than these dichotomies of reject, not reject, a better approach and I think the way that statistics is in general moving. So I'd encourage you to try to think about it like that. And again, I'm sorry if my uh, my misspeaking of the words alternative and null confused you, but uh, what is written on this slide is correct. So when we do formal hypothesis testing or formal statistical testing, it's always going to consist of, of these things. We're going to state our null and our alternative hypothesis. That's going to be step one. We're going to determine the value of our observed sample statistic. Then we're going to calculate and interpret the p-value. And we're going to do this right now using something called a randomization distribution, which we learned last class. And when we're doing it in this way, it's also referred to as a randomization test. And we're going to use that to calculate and interpret our p-value. Then we're going to make some generic decision about the null hypothesis, reject or do not reject it. And then we're going to write a sentence explaining the conclusion of the test in context to our original research question and indicating whether or not we have strong, uh, strong or convincing evidence for our alternative, the hypothesis that we're actually really interested in. <clears throat> so let's see this in action. Let's do an example. The U.S. Census Bureau's American Housing Survey contains information about housing and living conditions from various metropolitan areas. 500 respondents from Atlanta and 500 respondents from St. Louis were asked what their typical commute time to work each day was. For Atlanta drivers, it was 29.11 minutes, and for St. Louis drivers, the average time was 21.94 minutes. State the null and the alternative here. So, our null and our alternative are going to have to come from this question at the very beginning, <clears throat> which is, is the average commute time greater for Atlanta drivers than St. Louis drivers? So we, if you look in, this, uh, in our passage here, we see we have two sample means. We also know we have a categorical variable, which is city, either St. Louis or Atlanta. And then we have a quantitative variable, which is time driving. When you have a categorical and a quantitative, you're dealing with a difference in means. So we know we're going to have to do this as a difference in means. Those two bits of information are going to be helpful and to some extent redundant. So let's write it. So it's going to be mu of a 
equals mu of SL or mu of A minus mu of SL. And the A stands for Atlanta and the SL stands for St. Louis. It's equal to zero versus the alternative, which is that it's greater for Atlanta drivers than St. Louis drivers. And as I mentioned before, you really only have to do one of these sets, either set one or set two. You don't have to write them both ways. And I, I again, I do this just so that you can um, uh, you can get a better sense of this. So what is our observed sample statistic? So that's going to be x bar of a minus x bar of SL. And that's going to equal 29.11 minus 21.94. which is going to equal 7.17 minutes. <clears throat> now we need to find and interpret the p-value in stat key. So we're going to find it using our randomization distribution, and we're going to perform what's called a randomization test. So let's go over to stat key. So we know we want to deal with a randomization hypothesis test. We're looking for a test for difference in means. We're going to find the data set by cl clicking leniency and smiles. <clears throat> and there it is, commute time. Atlanta versus St. Louis. And we can see that Atlanta is labeled as sample one. St. Louis is labeled as sample two. And we can see their difference in means were calculated at 7.14, which is roughly what I calculated at. I got 7.17. Mine was different because of rounding. So let's create a randomization distribution. I mentioned this uh, last time how we would do it in this situation. Essentially what it's going to be like is we're going to take all 1,000 drivers that are in St. Louis and Atlanta. We're going to just basically put their names into a hat. We're going to draw the, their names out, 500 and put them into St. Louis, 500 and put them into Atlanta, except that those labels attached to their names are going to be arbitrary. We're just going to randomly assign them. And so in that situation, any differences we see between the two groups are just going to be differences that have arisen because of chance and chance alone. We're going to repeat that process, you know, 10,000 different times. So let's get started. All right, so we've done this now. Um, and we need to figure out, are we going to use left tail, two tail, or right tail? So our alternative was that Atlanta was greater than St. Louis. So we should do right tail. And we see by default it went to 2.272, which is going to cut off the upper 2.5%. Just by default, that's what it always does. So what we need to do is we need to click that button, and we need to put in 7.1%. Four. We'll use the 1.4 here instead of what we calculated as 1.7 because this is probably more accurate. We'll hit OK and Enter. And we see that our p-value says it's zero. Now, our p-value is technically never zero. So what we're going to say instead of zero is that it's less than 0 0.001. So our p-value is less than 0 0.001. So now we need to interpret it. Okay. So we're going to say that the probability, oh no, excuse me, given that there is no difference in the average commute time for drivers in Atlanta and St. Louis, the probability of observing a difference in means of 7.14 or greater is, .00, is less than 0 0.001. So given that the null hypothesis is true, the probability of observing a sample statistic as extreme or more than that observed is less than 0 0.001. Okay. Now let's make a formal uh, decision about, this should say decision, sorry. Decision about H, H naught, about our null hypothesis. Well, if we set alpha to 0 0.05, we see that P is less than alpha. When p is less than alpha, if you look above, where that means we're going to reject the null hypothesis, which means we're going to conclude that it's extraordinarily unlikely to observe these results if, in fact, 
I mean, these results. By these results, I mean uh, average commute time difference between these two cities of 7.14 minutes, given that there's no difference between the two cities in their average commute time. So it's extremely unlikely that that would occur. In fact, it would occur less than 0.001 percent. I mean, less than you know one percent of the time. Interpret the test in context, indicating whether or not we have convincing evidence for HA. So our p-value is extremely small. That means we do have convincing evidence for the alternative. And our alternative is that the average commute time is greater for Atlanta drivers than St. Louis drivers. So if we want to interpret our test in context, we would say we have strong evidence that the average commute time is greater for Atlanta drivers than St. Louis drivers. I see here too that I again have this one written wrong. We're going to do one more example of this. This should say also uh, make a formal decision. Does consuming beers attract mosquitoes? Experiments have been performed in Africa to reduce the spread of malaria by mosquitoes. In one such experiment, 43 volunteers are randomly assigned to consume either a liter of beer or a liter of water. And the attractiveness to mosquitoes of each volunteer measured as the number of mosquitoes per volunteer was measured. Uh, the experimenters believed that beer consumption would increase mosquito attractiveness. This is going to be an important piece. They believed that it would increase. And the average number of mosquitoes for volunteers in the beer condition was 23.6, and the average number of mosquitoes for the volunteers in the water condition was 19.2. State the null and alternative. Hopefully in this case, uh, you've, you've noticed that it's a difference in means. But as a reminder, we have both of these means stated. We're interested in their difference. And again, we're in a situation where we have a categorical variable, which is condition, either mosquitoes or, I mean, not mosquitoes, excuse me. Uh, we're in a, uh, a condition where it's either beer or water. And our outcome variable, our response variable, or, or should I also state here, our quantitative variable is going to be the number of mosquitoes. So our H0 and our HA are actually going to be the same as before. So mu of beer, mu of water. And then it's going to be mu of beer is greater than mu of water. What is the observed sample statistic? That's going to be x, sub b, uh, x bar sub b minus x bar sub w. 23.6 minus 19.2, which is going to be 4.4. So now we need to find and interpret the p-value and stat key. We have to do another randomization distribution. Create another one and do another randomization test. So we're, we're in the right place. Randomization test for difference in means. We just want to click our right, find our right data set. It should be mosquitoes, beer versus, oops, not arrival time, uh, beer versus water. And here we are. We're set up such that beer is on the bottom, water is on the top. Beer is group one, water is group two. We have our differences in means of 4.38. I don't remember what I calculated, but I feel like it was close to that. My value, again, was probably different because of rounding. And so um, our alternative hypothesis is going to work the way it's already written. Because if it was calculating this differently, we would need to flip our signs. And um, hopefully that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, uh, we'll talk about that in class. So we're going to generate 10,000 samples. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We're going to do a uh, right tail, and we're going to put plug in 4.38. We're going to just use, again, stat keys because stat key has all the data, and they're doing it with greater precision. The p-value here is 0.00, three zeros and a seven. Which is going to state that given that there is no difference in the average number of mosquitoes attracted to people in the beer condition or people in the water condition, the probability of observing a difference in mean number of mosquitoes between the two conditions of 4.4 or more, or, uh, of, 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 of a difference in conditions of 4.4 or more is 0 0.0007. So again, extremely unlikely, which means that with if we set alpha to 0 0.05, p is less than alpha, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis, meaning we're going to conclude that these two groups are not equal. They do not have the same um, mean number of mosquitoes. And we're going to interpret the test in context and indicating whether or not we have convincing evidence for our alternative. Our alternative is that it would increase mosquito attractiveness. Yes, 
because our p-value is extremely small, 0 0.00007, means it's extraordinarily unlikely that we'd observe results this great, given that the null hypothesis is true, which means it's really strong evidence in favor of the alternative, which states that um, beer consumption increases mosquito attractiveness. So I hope that this section makes sense, and I hope that this formal testing and decision-making uh, builds on the p-value material you learned in the last uh last section. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in class or to come and send me an email.